So hi everyone, as you're getting uh, signed in, we're just gonna wait for a few minutes for people to um, get signed in. We have lots of people who are just joining us now. So if you're just getting on, um, just give us a minute to get everybody uh, admitted. And again, we're just another uh, reminder, we're just getting a lot of people signed on at the last minute here. So, um, you know, as we're starting up, we just want to give everybody a minute or two just to get on board. So we'll get started in just, um, just a minute or two to let people sign on. We have quite a few who registered for today. So we want to just make sure that everybody has a chance to, um, to sign in before we get started. And in the meantime, you could maybe search out your chat function. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But while you have time here, you can go ahead and find your chat feature. And I'm just going to um, uh, send a note just so you kind of get used to what it is. Um, OK, so I've just typed a message in chat that just says, hi, everyone. So you're welcome to chat something back, just hello or whatever, just so you can, again, get used to the chat feature. Um, because I would like to be able to use that today for a little bit of interactivity. And it'll probably be our best method for most of the interactivity. Our best method is probably going to, um, to be the chat feature, um, just because we have a lot of folks who are um, online today. And so it might be easier if we have most everybody muted through most of the presentation so that we're not getting background noise. But there will be times um, after this initial presentation where there's plenty of time for you to unmute yourselves and um, have a conversation. So we will have those opportunities in a bit. But for the initial presentation, it's probably going to be easier if we make use of the um, chat feature. And again, we'll just wait another minute or two for people to get signed on. We're still getting people joining pretty regularly, Heather. So that's yeah, great. so I figure we'll just wait another uh, couple of minutes. Uh, it's better to, we have some extra time built in the schedule today, so we can wait a few minutes and get started after everybody's had a chance to sign in. And again, we have a pretty big crowd today, so we just want to make sure that everybody can sign in and uh, join us at the beginning. And you can let me know, Don, when things start to slow down <laughs> in the uh, waiting room. And I just want to alert everybody, you know, we're all working from home and we all have our situation. So there is a sleeping pug behind me and the pug sometimes snores. So <laughs> if you hear snoring, it's not because I'm sleeping. Um, and even though I could train asset management in my sleep, that is not what's happening. Um, it's the pug who's behind me is snoring and he can sometimes get pretty loud when he's snoring. So if you hear noise, that's, you can blame it on my pug. Uh, I think he's, I'll see if I can just for fun show you where he's laying on the floor. Let's see if we can do it. Uh, you can kind of see him. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm doing it here. Oh, my chair is in the way. So there's, the <laughs> so that's the sleeping pug. So if he's making noise, um, you can blame him. But he loves COVID lockdown, so he does not want us to go back to anything um, close to normal because it's so nice to be in the office all the time. <laughs> and he never got to go to work before. All right, Heather. It seems like we're pretty close to. Okay slowing down. <laughs> Great. All right, so we'll go ahead and um, get started. Um, so I did want to say one thing about technology too. So besides the sleeping pug, um, the other thing about technology is I was telling Don and Haley this morning that 
I always used to joke that I needed to clone myself because I traveled so much. I always needed to be in multiple places at once. And today is a perfect example that I finally have cloned myself through technology. So this morning I'm doing an asset management training for GILE, which probably would have been not in New Mexico, but somewhere else in the country, <clears throat> you know, maybe back east somewhere, or Midwest, but it most likely would not have taken place in New Mexico. So I would have had to travel there. And then this afternoon I'm doing an asset management training for the Seattle Public Utilities. So I have figured out how to be in two places in one day to do asset management training through the beauty of training. But I completely miss being in person um, and having that interactivity that you can usually have when there's, you know, people in a room together, you know, sitting in a classroom and um, around the table and you can have a lot more interactivity than you can when you're online like this. Um, and it's hard to just look at blank screen. So if anybody's able to leave their camera on, I would appreciate it just because it makes it nice to see faces instead of just blank computer screens. Totally understand if you can't totally get it, but it's just kind of nice to make it feel like there's actually people out there in the world that you're training <laughs> and not just little black screens, uh, little black squares. And then, like I said, we'll have the first part be about asset management and sort of the traditional approach. And then the rest of the, the time here today will be more interactive and talking about the green, uh, blending the green in. So we wanted to kind of go through the traditional asset management first, kind of get you the lay of the land there and then explain how we're adding green into it. So with that, um, I'm with the Southwest Environmental Finance Center and I'll show you my intro in just a moment. I probably should have put myself first, but in any case, we're from the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. And you can see our mission statement there, um, promoting self-reliance through innovative training and assistance focused on actionable results. We really try to build internal capacity of the organizations and entities that we work with. We're located in the Uni University of New Mexico School of Engineering and within the School of Engineering, the Center for Water and Environment. Um, so um, we have 11 staff members and today you'll get to meet uh, another, you'll, you'll get to meet at least three of us today. And we have been doing asset management for about 17, 18 years now. Um, it came out of the 1996 Safe Drinking Water Act amendments of um, uh, 1996 when they put technical managerial and financial capacity building within the Safe Drinking Water Act. And it was a great idea, but it was flawed in the sense that it, it wasn't very tangible. I call it the amoeba problem. So it kind of went everywhere and you could never wrap your arms around it, it's squishy. So we never kind of knew what precisely, you know, to tell people to do. And so it became hard to measure, it became hard to um, kind of figure things out. So asset management sort of grew a little bit out of that where it builds technical managerial and financial capacity, but in a much more systematic, framework type of way where you could measure improvements, you could show progress. So we jumped on the asset management bandwagon pretty early on. We were pretty early adopters when it was first coming from Australia and New Zealand to the US and we've been in it ever since. And that's what we spend a lot of time doing. We also do other things like water loss, um, tribal, uh, tribal drinking water compliance. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting lots and lots of other stuff, but kind of everything related to water, wastewater, stormwater, and assets, we kind of get involved in that. So uh, my name is Heather Himmelberger and I'm the director of the Southwest EFC. And I've been in this role since 1996 and been with the center for a couple of years longer than that, started in 94. Um, I am an engineer by training and the first part of my career was a traditional engineer working at a consulting firm doing traditional engineering stuff, you know, designing water and wastewater treatment plants, starting them up troubleshooting, all that kind of stuff. But I really like the operations management and finance side way, way better than the more traditional design side. So by choice, I left sort of that more traditional engineering world and moved into this operations management finance world, which I feel like asset management fits really well in that. And I have traveled to all 50 states multiple times each and worked with water and wastewater systems pretty much in all of those places. Um, so got to see lots and lots of different utilities. And I've also been to all the US territories. And uh, we're actually today kicking off a project with the Northern Mariana Islands and helping them with asset management 
in their water and wastewater utilities. So Dawn, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey everybody, I'm Dawn Knoll, um, and I uh, mimic Heather's career path in some ways. I'm also an engineer by training, have um, worked in pretty much drinking water, waste water for the majority of my career. Um, I started in uh, plastics because my background is chemical engineering, and I thought that plastics was the world for me. I took an environmental engineering course and realized that water was the world for me. Um, so not only in my career do I do I do water, but also in my personal life. Uh, I'm a remote employee since long before the pandemic. I've worked from home, um, so I am a. Uh, my office is physically in Knoxville, Tennessee, and so the picture there on the bottom uh, left side is my family and me and our boat on the Tennessee River, which I absolutely love and can't wait for every year to get back to and dread when it's over at the end of the season. <laughs> and then um, because we don't get enough time on the water, we put in a pool a couple of years ago. So my daughter's always in the water. If it's warm enough, she's already swimming. The water temperature is currently 66 degrees. You won't find me in the water yet, but <laughs> you will find my little fish in the water. And then okay, let me know when it gets to 90 and I'm, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> if that's not enough, we also, you know, try to make sure that there's water anywhere that we vacation. So, um, and, and it's maybe, um, you know, because I'm an Aquarius. I don't know. <laughs> so that's a little bit about me and, and my background. Okay. And Haley, whoops, passed you up. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, oh gosh, we got the wrong <laughs> Sorry. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm Minnie Heather. <laughs> we did have photos of me, but it's totally fine because uh, I, Heather has about that. done a lot more than I have been to cooler places. And she's also an HH like me. So she has to just put up with my pictures. And sorry about that. We had <laughs> the right slides and somehow it got screwed up. I apologize for that. That's okay. I am not an engineer by training. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have been at the Southwest Environmental Finance Center for almost three years now. And my background is in biology and water resources and, and environmental science. And so at the center, I do asset management training as well as um, regionalization and source water protection. So those are the areas I focus in. And uh, I tried really hard last night to find a lot of pictures with water in it just for this presentation. <laughs> uh, and but... they were beautiful pictures. So every <laughs> picture, these gorgeous pictures that Haley put together. And before this is over, I will dig out her pictures. <laughs> but uh, that's totally fine, Heather. And we're just excited that so many of you can join us today. We have a much bigger crowd than expected, which is great. And you will hear from Don and I later after Heather does the traditional asset management presentation. And we'll talk about the work in green infrastructure that we've been doing. Great. So this is one um, time that we're going to ask you to use the chat function. I would love to have you all introduce yourselves and by unmuting, but I know that we just have too many people today and it would take too much time. It would be too difficult. So unfortunately, we can't do it that way. So I would like you to find the chat function if you haven't already found it. <clears throat> it should look like... Um, uh, kind of looks a little different on different screens, but just find wherever it says chat. Um, sometimes you have to find the three dots and do more and the chat is there. <clears throat> but try to find your chat feature. And then, oops, I keep hitting buttons and it keeps moving. And then just type in, if you don't mind, in the chat feature, your name, your organization, and your role. Um, and you can keep that going as we move along. We won't wait till everybody types in, um, you know, on this slide. But if you could just take a moment and type in, we can save chats. So the nice thing about having a chat saved is we'll have everybody's um, name, organization, and role, and that sort of thing. So if you don't mind doing that, that is great. So keep that coming again as we go along. If you haven't done it yet, just do it as we go along to the next couple of slides. So our agenda for today is we'll start out, the longest part will be this morning where we'll kind of get the lay of the land on what asset management is using the traditional framework of asset management. And then I just want to have, it's technically not a presentation, the second one is just a little bit of talk about where we've been with asset management in the gray world and kind of get some of the transition because I think it's super important as we move into 
blending green into gray in the asset management framework for us to remember that the gray world took a long time to get where it is. So it's going to take us a little while to get the green world where we want to go. Um, and so I'll just talk a little bit about that. And then there's a time for Q&A or comments or discussion related to um, the gray asset management. We'll take a little break and then we'll look at integrating green into this traditional framework. And we're going to share the online um, guidebook, document, uh, I don't know, what's the proper terminology, Don, for <laughs> what we should call it? <laughs> framework, the framework. The framework, <laughs> the online framework. Um, Got to get the right terminology here. Um, so we'll have a chance to kind of walk through the portions of that and then an open discussion will end the day. And that really is your chance to you know, we'd like to spend a fair amount of time in that last open discussion with questions and thoughts and ideas and whatnot from you guys. So we're going to share the framework, which you might have had time to look at before. Monty, we're at the table. Um, and somebody is not muted. I'm not sure who. Um, so Don, maybe you can check into that. Um, all right. So that's our agenda for today. Um, so we're going to, and I do want to remind you again, you can type questions into the chat function and Don and Haley can be observing the chat box as we go. So if you have questions, if something is not making sense to you, um, if, you know, there's an acronym, you don't understand anything, go ahead and write it in the chat, chat box. And then Don and Haley will kind of monitor the chat box. And if there's stuff that can wait till the end, we can do that. If there's stuff that should be covered right away. Uh, we can cover things, you know, as we go along. So here's your first chance to use the chat feature. So what is the number one reason any water, wastewater, or stormwater utility exists? And you can substitute the word utility for system or whatever you call yourself, department, doesn't matter. It's just, you know, water, wastewater, stormwater. Why do you exist? What's the number one reason you exist? So just chat in an answer. Why do you think you're there. So I think many of you are with stormwater. Um, so why are you there? So we have answers coming in. Let me uh, read some of those. Um, so we have protect public health, provide services to community and protect the environment to meet public need, sanitation and public health, public health, um, protect public and the environment, provide a public service, public health, flood control, um, so all of those are great answers. Um, my number one answer is to serve your customers. So the number one reason you exist is so you can serve your customers. And many of the things that you put in there relate to customer service, but that is the number one reason. And if there were no customers, you wouldn't exist. So if nobody was there, you wouldn't need stormwater, you wouldn't need wastewater. In fact, the stormwater would be just probably doing its thing because nobody would be there. Um, so you're there to serve your customers. So now, similar question, what is the best reason to take on asset management? So we wanna chat in an answer. So we talked about why you exist. Now, what would be the best reason that you would take on asset management? And maybe you don't think you need it, but hopefully after today you'll be convinced that you want it. Um, so one answer is track how your program is working. Um, efficient and ef uh, effective and efficient utilization of the assets. What are some other answers? Uh, cost effectively maintain infrastructure, continue supporting customers, <clears throat> public service, build strategy for service delivery, use public funds appropriately, inform and prior prioritize decision, uh, long-term budgeting, make sure you're serving your customers. That's one that I'll probably glom onto and say, that would be kind of my answer is to better serve your customers. So a lot of the answers that you put in there are related to better service. So I would say the number one reason you exist is to serve your customers. And the reason you do asset management is to better serve those customers because you are going to um, serve your customers, whether you do quote asset management or not, I always try to make it clear, you are managing your assets. Whether you think 10 seconds about asset management or not, you're managing them. They are doing something today. Whether they're doing it good or bad is 
a whole nother question, but they're doing something. You are serving your customers. The whole point of asset management is so we can maybe do that better, so we can better serve our customers. So by its very definition, asset management is meeting the desired level of service at the lowest life cycle cost. So the desired level of service is basically the utility exists to serve its customers and the lowest life cycle cost is essentially the better serve. So we're trying to do it in the best way. And lowest life cycle cost requires a lot of things. It sounds super simple and in concept, maybe it is super simple, but in practice, it does require us to know a lot of things. So if we want to say we're there to serve customers, we have to think about what kinds of things our customers want. So on the screen, there's lots of things they want. And one other big thing they want is low cost. And that's true no matter what kind of utility. And I think probably even more so in the stormwater world, it's probably even harder to get your customers to actually care and want to pay for that. And you know, to start a stormwater fee or some kind of stormwater charge becomes really difficult. So the amount the customers are willing to pay provides the utility its resources. So the green box is sort of the time and money, and these colored boxes are what you want to do. And you'll notice that the revenue doesn't always cover all of the items. So what ends up happening is we have to spread our money around and we have to make choices about, we're gonna do this, but we're not gonna do that. Uh, some things we're not gonna do at all. Some things we're gonna do most of, and some things we're just gonna do partially, but we've got to make choices. And it's important for us to think about what the impact of those choices actually is. So are we actually doing the highest priority um, customer service requirements? So if you thought about all the things your customers wanted, you have to prioritize them because you probably can't do everything you want to do for everybody all the time. So are you doing the highest priority things and how would you know? And what would you do if you're not doing that? So how do you respond if you're not actually meeting what the customers want? So that's where asset management comes in is to provide you more of a framework structure to be able to make those decisions in the best way for the customers. So one core component is setting an overall mission and level of service goals. So, you know, basically what is the mission statement of the organization? So here's a chance to type in. Um, so if you have a mission statement, um, let us know. So just say yes, if you have one, and if you actually know it, if you could chat in, like assuming it's not super long, I don't expect you to write paragraphs, but if you actually have a fairly short mission statement, um, go ahead and chat it in and we'll kind of watch the um, chat feature. And if anybody has chatted in a mission statement, I would love to share it. Um, because one goal about a mission statement is to make it sort of short and succinct that it's fairly easy to remember what it is. And I am seeing some yeses that you have mission statements, which is great. So the mission statement grounds the organization and kind of binds it together. And then the service level goal or the system's level of service goals are kind of derived from and support that mission statement. So when we have the mission statement, goals grow out of that. Um, kind of as many goals as you want, but typically we don't want to have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of goals um, related to the mission statement. We're going to have some really good goals that we can track and measure progress. So we have one coming in. Um, so keep stormwater clean is one of them. Another one, environmental services manages Portland's wastewater and stormwater infrastructure to protect public health and the environment. Nice and short and is cool because those are ones you could remember. And again, they would ground um, your organization. So for example, the really short one, we'll pick that one, keep stormwater clean. So if that was our mission statement and that was sitting in here, keep stormwater clean, it would be really easy to come up with goals what would you have to do in order to keep stormwater clean? What other goals must I create to make that goal or to make that mission statement true? So those could be things related to maintenance. They could be things related to operations, um, all kinds of activities. So you can picture what you need to do to meet that mission statement. Uh, we have a couple more coming in. That's great. Uh, Metropolitan Sewer District of Greater Cincinnati protects the environment and public health through the collection and treatment of wastewater for 43 of the 49 political subdivisions. I won't name all the counties. Um, Kansas City Water ensures uh, the accessibility and quality of water services to meet the growing needs of our region by investing, uh, uh oh, it just went up. Uh, sorry about that. By investing in the future of our water, wastewater, and stormwater systems. So great. Uh, it's really cool to see so many mission statements. That's fantastic. So if we take one of those individual goals that we set, 
we would need to say, well, what are the specific assets we need to meet the goal? So we've started with our mission statement, we created a goal, now we need assets to make that goal actually happen. And which are the most critical assets? And then how will the assets be sort of operated, maintained, repaired, rehabilitated, and replaced to sustainably meet our goal? And then what's the funding av available to get all that done? And if we um, considered all the goals, that would drive into all of the assets that we have, the criticality of our collection of assets, and then looking at the overall life of each of the assets in that collection, and then the money that's available. So this little pathway that we've talked about is kind of answering these five major questions. You know, What service level do we want to provide? What assets do we have? Which ones are the most critical to providing the service? How do we ensure the assets are gonna do their jobs over their lifespan? And do we have the money to get it all done? These also have labels, level of service, current state of the assets, criticality, life cycle costing, and long-term funding. And you will hear this a lot throughout today. And as we go into the framework, we have it set up by these five core components. So you'll see this five core component version um, pretty much the way we talk about asset management. So I've sort of shown it linear, you know, the last couple of slides. and. Asset management is not linear at all. It's very circular. Everything connects to everything else. It has no beginning or end. So this isn't um, the situation where, okay, we're starting today because you've been managing these assets for however long you've had them. So there really isn't um, a beginning to the process and there's not an end because asset management is a journey, not a destination. So we're not trying to get somewhere where you can kind of check the box and say, hey, I got this great asset management plan, I'm done. It's really about you know, always looking for that continuous improvement. So there's never a chance where you'll say, I'm actually done with it. Um, it's always gonna be part of the journey. So the main reason we wanna do asset management is for the benefits that we can accrue. And we talked, you, know, you guys chatted in several benefits before when you were talking, when I asked you why you wanted to do asset management. And the benefits are categorized as financial, environmental, and social. And we refer to that as the triple bottom line. So who benefits from asset management is the general public. So your customers and those who come into your system who are just there on vacation or they're visiting or they're using your businesses or whatever. So that's, you know, the general public is one. Any of your elected leaders, your owners, you know, depending on what kind of system you are, like those people who are at the top, who own and manage and kind of have that final decision making power, and then your staff. So I think it's super, super important not to forget about staff as being a beneficiary of asset management, because it's not all about the outside. It's about who's working for you as well. So it's important to consider the benefits in the three categories for the three different groups of people. And so we're just going to quickly go through what some of these categories are. So again, financial um, includes cost savings, cost avoidance, and revenue benefits. And on the screen, um, there's several benefits that you could think of tons more, and they're just divided by those categories. And the big difference between cost savings and cost avoidance is a cost savings is a situation where you're still doing that activity, but you're doing it in a cheaper way. Cost avoidance is I don't have to do the activity at all. So I've done one thing to prevent something else from happening. So let's say your storm grates um, always get clogged up from debris. And so you have to send somebody out over and over again to clean out the debris. But then you figured out, well, hey, if I put uh, some other system in place, street sweeping or you know more garbage pickup, whatever, that prevents garbage or debris from getting in there, and you don't have to clean it every month, but you can rather clean it every year. Now I've avoided the cost of doing it 11 times. So it's a, an avoidance cost that I can show as a saving. So it's just a slight terminology difference. They kind of get you to the same place, but, but just slightly different ways. And then we have environmental benefits. And I just categorize them as sort of regulatory type benefits, resource benefits, and then waste benefits. So again, here's some examples of benefits in those various categories of how you can impact the environment. And then social benefits are anything that will impact people. So again, those customers of how do we impact people? 
and benefit them? How do we benefit our elected leaders? And then how do we benefit our employees? And so here are some examples of social benefits. And again, you know, there's lots more benefits you could pick, but I just wanted to give some ideas of the types of benefits that you might accrue from doing this. And we sometimes think of asset management as this big thing, like we're doing asset management, but it's also a collection of bunches of little pieces of activities that you might do every single day. So it's also important to think about the benefits of individual pieces and not just the benefits of the whole program. So it is important to actually go through the task of determining specific benefits of the activities you choose to do in both qualitative and quantitative terms. So the quantitative terms is more that money stuff, um, or you could count certain things, like you could count an improvement on your regulatory um, um, compliance and that sort of thing. But it's also qualitative where you could say like, hey, we have a happier community or we have um, housing values went up or we have you know, done something qualitatively to improve the lives of our community. And what I have observed is very few utilities actually go through the last step of quantifying those benefits and being able to share them widely within the organization and out in the community. Big mistake, because I think that's a huge selling point to asset management and to investment. So I think it's an area where we need to improve. Um, I've been working a lot on and I chaired a committee for two years for AWWA on the benefits of asset management to try to figure out how we can get this practice stepped up. Um, because I've worked with lots of utilities where I know for absolute fact they've had certain benefits and I say, well, how much did that save you? Well, I don't know. I'm sure it saved me a lot. It's like, okay, well, let's go through the process of how many hours did you not have to spend and how many things didn't you have to buy or whatever the case may be. So don't forget as you move forward with asset management activities, keep in mind how to quantify the benefits and how to share that with people so that you can actually say this did this and people will support your program. So now I'll we'll kind of go back to the basics here. So it's important to do the basic functions well. So we want our asset management program to help you do that. So, you know, if we use like a sports metaphor for just a second here, um, when you're trying to win a game, like a football game or a soccer game or a baseball game, you're thinking about there's very basic things that you have to do well. So if you're going to play football, you have to be able to throw the ball, catch the ball, run the ball. And you don't have to have, you're not going to win a game by doing, you know, 500 fancy plays, you're going to win the game because you're doing the basics, you're running, you're holding the ball, you know, same thing with something like baseball, you know how to catch the ball or pitch the ball or hit the ball. So we want asset management to be sort of not a flashy thing. It's just about doing the basics like, okay, I got to keep, you know, water quality up, I got to worry about stormwater quantity, things like that. So we really want it to focus heavily on the basics. And you know, being able to answer the question, do you spend most of the time just trying to get those basics right? Or are you kind of, you know, maybe a more of the flashy stuff, if you will, um, because that's, you know, important thing. So let's go back to the five core components and we'll walk through a little bit more deeply about what each of them are. And we start with the level of service. A lot of people would start with the inventory or the current state of the assets, but we think the level of service is really an important, such an important component that we kind of put it first in the five core components. And again, since it's circular, it doesn't really matter where you start, but we like to discuss level of service first. And the purpose is really to have the mission statement and level, level of service goals provide that direction for managerial and operational and financial decisions. And it's gonna set the overall policies, goals and procedures for the organization and kind of put everybody on the same page. So if we have <clears throat> the level of service, we kind of think about that as a roadmap of where you're going and how you're going to get there. And so here I am today, I'm sitting right here uh, with the crossroads of I-25 and I-40. I'm very close to that point. So if I wanted to go somewhere else, so let's say I was going to go to Seattle just to pick a place. Um, there are lots and lots of roads that would get me to Seattle. So I could actually go east and then I could go north and then I could go west. Or I could actually go south and through Texas and up around and here, and then I could go to California and up. But the most direct route for me to go, and I have made this trip numerous times when my daughter was going to school in Tacoma, 
um, is right up through this road, which is actually in the west. These roads are really good and you go this way and up and it's the most direct efficient path. And it's going to have the best results for the least expenditure. And that's level of service. So if I have no goals, I could be driving any of these roads to get from where I am to where I want to be. And I would have no idea if that's the most efficient, effective way, or if it's least efficient and effective. So what I really want is to have that roadmap that tells me this is the best, most cost efficient way to get where I want to go. And that's where, you know, the goals really come in. So we have uh, a couple of characteristics of desired level of service goals. So we wanna keep these in mind being meaningful, measurable, which is probably the most important one, consistent, useful, and unique. And the having the goals isn't going to help us if we can't or we don't measure them. So here's just an example of one utility and how it chooses to measure things. You could use any number of ways, but it's just real important to be very concise and easy to interpret what's going on. And I've spent um, a fair amount of time in Australia and New Zealand studying how they do things. And this is something that I took away from them as well. This is not from there, this is from um, the US. But they have these really quick, easy to identify where your, where your goals are and whether you met or not. And some of the, um, the equivalents of what would be a mayor or governor in New Zealand, because they don't have states, but like their district council person um, would just look at these every week and say, okay, where do they fall? What's being met, what's not? And what adjustments do I need to make? And you know, like in 10 seconds, you can figure out what's going on. So it's real, real important to share those kinds of things. And then you can use these written goals and the measurement of them to change your operation and management. So what do I need to do? If I'm not meeting the goals, what changes do I need to make? Um, does it need to be training? Does it need to be equipment? You know, is there design flaws that make it difficult? You just have to have a kind of dig deeper to find out why you're not meeting the goals and then you can make changes so you can meet them in the future. So the current state of the assets is when we get into um, which assets um, should be, um, or the assets um, in the inventory should support the operational management and business analysis functions. So this is where we get into, um, you know, how best to kind of get an inventory of our assets. And the asset inventory should include all the assets and we need, <clears throat> so we need to define what an asset actually is. So uh, not every nut and bolt in your system needs to be in the inventory. And yesterday when I was talking to a utility, they said they put 12,000 assets from one facility into the asset management program. And I said, are you kidding me? Like, how could you possibly manage 12,000 things from one facility? So we're not talking the whole thing with all their pipe. We're talking like one piece of it. And they literally went down to every light fixture and the bulbs in the light fixtures. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> you will drive yourself insane. So we don't wanna do that. We want to have a definition of what an asset is. So, you know, certain money amounts don't have to, you know, be assets. So if it's worth, you know, 30 bucks, what do I care? Um, so we're really trying to focus in on just the things we want to manage in a, in a managed, uh, you know, framework kind of way and forget everything else. Because uh, like I have this lamp sitting beside me right now, I would not put a lamp in my asset inventory. If this thing broke, I'm going to throw it away and I'm going to buy a new one. I'm probably not even going to take the time to try to fix it because it's about a $20 lamp. So that's the kind of thing we want to go through is, you know, what matters as an asset and what doesn't so that you can manage, you know, a more efficient number of things. So the robust asset inventory should include all the attributes that are meaningful to you and answer the questions you want to answer. So colors and things of that nature might be not be important to you. So you don't have to include them, but like size and type and serial numbers and manufacturers and that kind of thing really matters. So picking out the things that matter and leaving out the things that don't is really important. And then having these like parent and child and grandchildren relationships so you can have hierarchies and you can decide how to structure your hierarchy. So for example, if you have um, 
we're trying not to get too much in green assets now because we're getting to that later. But if you have a green asset that has gray components and natural plant components, you can figure out how to structure that for what is the parent, what is the children assets of those kinds of assets. And two categories are a little bit more difficult. We need condition of assets and useful life remaining. So we'll just for a minute talk about that. So the condition defines the physical state of the asset at that moment in time. And it helps inform things like maintenance and useful life remaining and that type of thing. Useful life remaining is gonna tell you how long you expect the asset to remain in, op in um, operation, delivering the service that you want. And it is not the age of the asset. So assets decay over time on some pattern and it can be any number of patterns. And of course in the green asset world, it can be a completely different thing where it starts maybe lower condition and gets better over time. So gray assets typically decay, but green assets don't necessarily. But at some point, the asset will reach a minimum, ex service, minimum acceptable service level. So meaning the asset is not doing what we want it to do anymore. And we were showing some pictures of hydrants uh, and they're kind of easy to understand. Um, so, you know, what level would that be for hydrants? So that would be when the hydrant no longer flows water or maybe when it no longer flows fire flow amount of water or it doesn't open, something along those lines, pretty simple. You know, that's, it doesn't do what we want anymore. So right at that point, I wouldn't, I need to do something, I need to intervene. And then you can think about any other types of assets, you know, where would those points be? <clears throat> so here we are today in 2021. And you know, when is the date that we're likely to reach that minimum service level? And let's say it's 2041. So this asset has a remaining useful life of 20 years. And these are your best guess estimates. There is no useful life police that will arrest you if you do it wrong, but it is better than using age alone because age is a pretty poor predictor of how long an asset will last. And really true for green assets, age is probably not a good predictor at all. And then it's likely to overestimate how soon you need to replace assets. And it doesn't take into account any of those other factors that go into how long an asset's gonna last. And you'll have to store your data in some kind of way. Um, generally speaking, it's some kind of computer program, but it can be as simple as spreadsheets and as complicated as you know, some of the really expensive asset management softwares that are out there. And there's lots and lots of software that you can buy that does all kinds of different things. We want to make the inventory as complete as possible. We want to prioritize the most important assets and data. We want to keep the inventory current. We want to update it as errors are found. And in addition to the attribute information, we want to have some kind of mapping system. So where are assets located in our system? And again, there's lots of options on how to map and how sophisticated you want to be with mapping. But for assets out in the field, it's real important to have some kind of map that will show where they are. So criticality gets into risk analysis and we wanna prioritize our projects based on criticality so that we know we're spending our limited dollars in the right place. So we look at two things, you know, the probability of failure as well as the consequence. When we get into the probability, we have four different ways assets can fail. And this is super, super important for the green world because your assets may fail in a completely different way than gray assets. So most gray assets, we talk about mortality failures, the physical failure of the asset. So something happens, it cracks, it breaks, it falls apart, it can't do its job anymore. But there's other kinds of failures. There's level of service failures, meaning it's not doing what I want it to do. So it's failed me because it doesn't meet the needs of my customers or the needs of my uh, management. So we got to replace it with something else that will. We have capacity failures where it doesn't meet the physical capacity requirements. So it doesn't hold enough water. It doesn't pump enough. It, you know, it, the pipe isn't big enough. Um, and that may be another failure mode that's fairly important in the green world. And then financial efficiency inefficiency is last where that's where it's, you could continue to use the asset. You could continue to fix it. But if you did, you're spending your money kind of unwisely. It's like, you know, anybody who like me has had their car forever, um, you start to get to that point where I'm replacing the brakes and then I'm doing the radiator and then I'm doing the belts and hoses and on and on. And you start pouring so much money into it. You should just buy a new car because the O&M is too high. I could keep the car running. I could keep replacing parts, but maybe I shouldn't. And that's what financial inefficiency is about. 
So on the consequence of failure side, uh, we have financial, environmental, social, these should look really familiar. But unlike before, when we talked about the benefits, so the good side of them, this is looking at the bad side. So what would happen if this asset failure, failure occurred, what would happen to the environment? So you can kind of see a failure where a pipe break and there's water all over the road. Um, what would be the environmental impact of that? Now, if you think about it as stormwater or wastewater, what's the impact? If it's water, what's the impact? So there's lots of, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's a yeah. question. I'm just ask you. What's <laughs> I saw you on mute. I thought something's going on. <laughs> so um, a mortality failure, again, is when it physically breaks. So let's say it's a pipe and it gets a crack across the top. So that would be a mortality failure. Or let's say there's a hydrant and somebody smashes into it and the hydrant you know, gets kind of cracked and broken, that would be a mortality failure. Um, so anytime that the physical structure of that asset is kind of being negatively impact, in the green world, it could be you know, some truck pulls over your plants and smashes them all to the ground or somebody you know, pulls them out of the ground by the roots or something, those could be mortality failures as well. So anything where the physical asset is actually being impacted is a mortality failure. And again, just a reminder, keep the questions coming. Um, the environment, or when we do this in class, we actually have an activity where we'll do a ranking criteria and people will often say, well, this is a value judgment kind of thing. And it absolutely positively is. There's not like a hard and fast, how do you value one environmental impact versus a social impact versus a financial impact? It does matter. Each organization has to kind of value that for themselves. And that's influenced by your level of service. So what you set as important to you for level of service will help you say what's important in financial, environmental, and social consequences. So we typically- Heather, oh. I'm sorry, there's another question yes. for Marie Light in the chat. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, sure. Um, if you are doing long-term financial planning to place an asset that has passed its minimum service level, level in a particular time frame, what other criteria besides age would you use? So I would use things like, what's the maintenance history of that asset? Um, how was it designed and constructed? What is the material it's made out of? Um, uh, what has been done over time? What is the history we've seen over time? A lot of this is using people who work with those assets and asking them very specifically, how much longer do you think this can do its job? And if you go by age, uh, just as one example, we had a wastewater treatment plant and they used age as their main criteria. And about 75 to 80% of the assets were quote, past useful life. At the same time, the wastewater plant was in great shape, way below permit limits, really well maintained. Uh, one of the best maintained plants I've seen, uh, you know, in my travels, a really good setup. And so the, the boss looked at this and said, oh my God, this plant is 75%, like I got to put in a brand new plant, basically. We don't have money for that. And I said, but something's not right here because your plant is working just fine. So if 75% of it is already past useful life, how is it actually doing its job? Like there's a miss, you know, something's missing here. So we went around with the operator to every single asset. I said, take me from the start of the plant to the finish of the plant. And then we would do the, the solids handling and you know, the offshoot parts of the plant. And I would say, you rank this one as outside its useful life for like the last, you know, it's been done for a couple of years. Um, why do you feel that way? Oh, no, no, I could get another 10 years out of this. This thing works great. And so we went through the plant and kind of just walked through with him and his operators and redid the whole thing. And there was 20% of the assets past useful life. And most of that was related to um, uh, obsolescence, where they had equipment that the manufacturer would no longer provide spare parts. You couldn't get anybody to work on it. Um, so it was that type of thing. So most of that 20% was actually not their fault. Like if they could still get parts and not have to machine make parts, they could have kept using those assets. So it's really more about how are they doing the job they're supposed to. And if you just use age, it won't necessarily tell you if the asset is doing its job. By the same token, you can have an asset, like there's a water plant I worked with, they're 
pipe assets at six to eight years were breaking. And we are in huge trouble. If our pipe assets are failing in less than 10 years, massive problems. So if they would use age, they say, I got a hundred years out of that plastic pipe. No, they got six to eight. So they found out it was a manufacture, well, not a manufacturing, a construction defect. Like they needed to put more bedding sand in. So again, age will tell you something different than what you're actually seeing. So for them, they needed to have a completely different CIP for all of that pipe you know, needed to be replaced so much faster. So that's why it's like really important um, to think about how the assets are performing for you and not just age. Um, so let me see. Uh, yeah, a couple more questions, questions coming in, Heather, but for the sake of time, I can kind of address them in the chat if you want. And then um, if there's something I can't address in chat, then I can bring it up to you. How about that? That sounds great. And I do agree with that comment that uh, failure is the inability to, to provide service. Um, so let's keep going. Um, so we have the calculation of criticality. We typically rank POF and COF from a one to whatever. We like to use one to five. It's not, you know, you don't have to do it that way, but you rank POF and COF as one to five, one to five, and then multiply them together to get your criticality, criticality score. So like a two probability of failure and a four consequence would give you a criticality of eight. So on a one to five scale, you get from one to 25. And the higher number is always the higher risk, higher criticality and lower numbers, lower risk. There are ways to reduce risk. And one of the most common when you can't reduce the consequences is redundancy. So if it's super risky, I have to have two of them or three of them. Um, so that if that asset fails, there's another asset to pick up the load. And we like to visualize risk. Um, so if we look at probability of failure going this way and consequence going that way, higher risk assets will end up on the upper right and lower risk assets are on the bottom left. And risk does play a good role in making informed decisions. So every asset will fit on the criticality chart somewhere. So it can be just for one class of assets or you can do all your assets together, you know, however you wanna visualize it. And we use it to help us decide like, when do we wanna to run to failure? Let the asset go as long as it can. And then when it fails, we fix it. Uh, when do we wanna monitor for potential failures? Cause we don't really want them to happen. Well, that's kind of in this area of the chart. And when do we wanna replace early? And that's kind of upper, up in the upper right. And we use our expenditures to drive down risk. So if I'm spending money in this part of the, of the risk profile, I can drive risk whatever direction I want based on how I spend the money. But if I spend money in this area, I will not change the risk profile one iota. So it will stay the same. Making a low risk asset slightly less low risk is not going to help me. So this is where, you know, if I had $10,000 to spend and I spend it here, nothing changes. If I spend 10,000 up here, a lot changes. So this is where you can get more bang for the same amount of dollars. You can get a lot more uh, out of it if you do it in the high risk areas. Um, so down here, we really wanna minimize our expenditures, You know, keep it to basically just routine maintenance. Um, here, we're gonna do more of that predictive maintenance where we're trying to figure out ahead of time when we should intervene. Down here, again, mostly routine, a little bit of preventative maintenance when we start to see the asset fail, assuming we don't wanna just let it fail outright. And then here we would be doing kind of whatever we needed to do until the asset was replaced. So we're gonna limp it along. If we know replacement is coming in a year, we'll just limp it along. If replacement is five years, we might do a little bit more, but we don't wanna have those assets fail. So we also wanna consider risk tolerance. So what amount of risk would you wanna put up with? You know, so different portfolios have different amounts of risk. And you wanna think about, you know, is there a risk profile that your organization would be okay with? And did you actually consider that or did it just happen? So based on the assets you have, there's a certain amount of risk. Uh, you can let it happen that way, or you could say, you know, something like this is too risky. I'm going to intervene and do a lot of redundancy to try to reduce it. So there's different ways to go about like how much risk tolerance do you really want to have? So moving on to life cycle costing, um, that's an examination of the entire life of the asset. So we want to think about the assets life cycle and what that actually is. 
So the asset's life starts with conceptual design or planning. Then it goes to detailed design, uh, construction, operation, maintenance, repair, rehabilitation, and replacement. And then we need money to do all of this. So again, the asset's life starts during the planning phase. And the reason this matters is that's when you have influence. So the influence over your assets is greatest in the planning phase at the least cost. So this is where we have the most influence at the least cost. As we move into design, we start to drop in influence and increase in cost, but we still want to fix any concerns that we have there. As we move into construction, it is going to be costly. We're going to have to do change orders, but it's still worth it. So you don't want somebody to continue constructing it wrong, uh, even if you have to spend some money because you're going to have problems. And then finally, when we get to the operation, most of the costs are sunk. You already know exactly what kind of assets you have, where they're going to be, uh, what material they're made out of, how they were installed, all of that has taken place. So you have a lot less influence, like very little, and it costs you a ton to do anything about it. So that's why we always wanna consider the planning phase and design phase to be the assets beginning, because if we can have a collaborative relationship between O&M and engineering, and that's both with inside the organization and any outside contractors you use, it will really help you because you have the best opportunity to really make change. And when you're doing construction, that's another good opportunity because um, construction makes a huge difference in how long an asset lasts and how well they operate. And that's really, really true in the green world. You really wanna think about how assets are constructed and what you can do to improve the way they're constructed so that they will do what you want them to do. So really, really important to think through construction. And then after construction comes the intersection of asset management and managing assets. So part of asset management is thinking about the collective and what's strategic for all assets. And part of it is thinking about individual assets and what's strategic for them. Most of the rest of asset management, we're really talking about sort of strategic decisions as a whole. But here in life cycle, we look at both. We're looking at those individual assets as well as the collection. We can intervene um, all along the way of the assets life, but we're gonna focus for a minute on the latter part. So the O&M and beyond. Uh, we always talk about operation and maintenance, but they're actually two different things. So in operations, we're talking about those day-to-day -day activities that um, uh, help you get your job done, you know, turning on valves, turning off things, uh, just making sure everything's working the way it should. And our goal is to maximize the uptime of the asset. So the time that it's actually in operations. So it's operations time or it's uptime. We want to maximize that. And it can be interrupted by any planned maintenance can interrupt that, any expected failures, as well as any unexpected failures. So an expected failure is every type of asset has a way you expect it to fail, including green assets. You might expect certain plants to die off or the soil to degrade. So things you know about, and you can plan for those because you know they're gonna happen. And unexpected failure is I had no idea that would actually take place. So something happens that, um, one of my favorite examples is I never knew a car had an oil sending unit. But one day, lo and behold, we're on the side of the road because our oil sending unit failed. I have never known any other person who had the same failure as me, didn't even know we had one. I'd call that an unexpected failure. Whereas like, you know, if your brakes start squealing because they're wearing out, that's expected. I expect my brakes to go bad. I expect my air filter to need change. I expect my oil, oil to go bad, but I didn't expect the oil sending unit. So we want to try to minimize um, what operate what uh, interrupts our uptime. And then along the asset's life as it's sort of going down its curve, and again, the curves can look different for green and gray, and this is more of a gray curve. Uh, proactive work is what we do before we have any potential failures, and reactive work is what we do after. So if we have a potential failure, meaning we can kind of see the assets going south, we hear something, there's a vibration, something is noticed, that I think this is going to go south or maybe plants start slowly to die off and I can intervene ahead. And then that prevents the functional failure, meaning it's not doing what I want anymore. And if we prevent that from getting worse, we're not going to have a catastrophic failure. 
So what are the options when an asset fails? You can create an asset failure decision tree that kind of walks you through the process. And this is one we created for a utility. And the big part is that by the end, there's a lot more choices you can make instead of just a simple repair. There's a whole bunch of choices that can be made all the way from redesigning the asset to finding a non-asset solution to abandoning the asset all together. Um, we're looking for efficiency gains and hopefully by getting more proactive, energy efficiency, spare parts, that type of thing, we have an efficiency gain. So that would not reduce our budget. That's not what we're about, but we wanna save money and time in one area so we can use it in another. So every utility faces a backlog of work and that's where you can kind of use this efficiency gain to help you um, with the work that you need to do. So lastly, with our five core components, we have funding. So we need adequate funding to cover the full cost of operation and do any replacements we need to do. So we go back to our concept of all the things we need to do and the money that we have to do it. And the first four components are trying to increase our efficiency, which should help us decrease the pie a little bit for what we have to do. It's not going to shrink it to matching how much time and money we have, but it will shrink it a little bit. If we can get more efficient and be more uh, careful about how we spend our money, that can shrink. So this part is aimed at maybe a affecting the funding part, the green part. So is there a way to grow that funding? So if we think about our potential sources of funding, is there a way to get, you know, other money into the system, raise rates, you know, anything like that? Because we want to cover the full cost of operation. And one of the ways is to increase those user charges and fees, but that's always tricky. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, and customers' ability to pay as well as willingness to pay enters into the picture. And one possible way to gain support is if we show the need for incremental funding and how that matters to a utility. So it is really important to um, understand how much money should be invested on average every year to keep the same level of service that you want without causing the risk portfolio to degrade. So, you know, if you're looking at that incremental investment. Scenario one is, hey, we're just meeting our needs. So the risk portfolio stays kind of the same um, and the level of service is being met. Then we can also have incremental investment that's less than that, which means we're going to get more risky, more bad things are going to happen. There's a backlog of replacements, level of service will go down. And then we can have our third scenario where we invest more than the requirement. So the risk portfolio improves, the level of service gets maintained or increases and work backlog decreases. So one way to look at that is your replacement cycle. And it can be uh, one measure of how close you are to kind of keeping things status quo. So if we look at the total cost of replacing your entire system, which you know is an order of magnitude estimate, we're not trying to get to like 10 million, 965,000, we're getting 10 million versus 100 million. And then your average incremental investment. So if you looked at what you've invested in the facility over the last 10 years and divided by 10, you know, what is that average incremental investment? Um, so let's say this is uh, numbers for a bigger utility, but let's say, um, and I will say that it actually matches, this wasn't taken from Albuquerque, but Albuquerque's um, water and wastewater infrastructure is $5 billion. Um, so it, let's take the, the total replacement at 5 billion and we were investing 25 million a year. Uh, the replacement cycle would be 200 years. This is the replacement cycle that we've been at for pipe for quite a while. So we've been as a nation about a 200 year replacement cycle, which means I expect pipe to last 200 years. I don't know about your pipe, but the pipe I know of, not gonna do it, not gonna make it 200 years. So if our average replacement cycle, if we look at our system and we come up with 200 years, one possibility is that yes, our assets will last 200 years, we're doing great, things are wonderful. Another possibility is our assets are only gonna last 75 years, we're gonna have massive problems, we're not investing enough. The last scenario is our assets are gonna last 300 years, so we're investing you know, really good. 
most gray assets, we are way under investing. Their life cycle is really short. When you get to green, the life cycle can be longer. So it's a, actually an interesting conversation because if you're talking about natural assets that we don't really expect to go away in a hundred years, um, it's kind of a little bit different replacement cycle conversation, but it's still a really important conversation to think about, you know, how are you investing compared to those replacement cycles? And if you're not investing enough, how do you increase that so that the community understands that there is a real risk to not doing what you need to do and a real benefit of investment? So um, if you think a little um, sort of southwest of where I am to um, Los, um, Los Angeles, where they had the big UCLA campus pipe burst. So this was a few years back. It was really dramatic. Kids were like, um, surfing down the streets and such. Um, anybody know what the replacement cycle was for them? Um, so anybody have any guesses as to what Los Angeles's replacement cycle was prior to that event happening? So go ahead and chat in and get, <clears throat> excuse me, chat in a guess if you have one. So we have 200 years, we have 100 years. And Heather, while that's while people are chatting in, I just wanted to remind people that we do have time on the agenda for uh, question and answers after your presentation, but they can feel free to continue to type things in. I am addressing the ones that are coming in via chat, um, but also I think that um, you know there's a ton of information that you're throwing out there. So if people have questions, we do have some time on the on the agenda for that here in just a few more minutes. Great, but but you. Tattoo. <laughs> yes. So we have uh, 200 years, 100, 1,000, 250. A um, couple of you were close. It was actually 300 years. So the level of investment in LA in their infrastructure at that time was 300 years. The pipe that burst was, I think it was 97 years old, a riveted steel pipe under high pressure. So the rivets just popped. Um, they had the engineers had actually identified it as a high risk asset that should have been replaced. But because they were on the 300 year replacement cycle, it didn't happen. So, you know, over time, the consequences can be severe if we don't address those backlogs. And that's, you know, again, one way to get that customer support that we don't want these events to actually occur. This is really bad. It was, I forget how many hundreds of millions of dollars, but somewhere around the 300 to $500 million range of all the damage that was caused by this event. Um, and there were, hundreds of cars that were impacted in a parking garage and all kinds of stuff. So we don't want these events to happen. So we want to keep our incremental investment up such that we're not having this kind of event. I mean, it's quite possible that we're not going to, you know, invest exactly $25 million per year because we do have these replacement waves that are going to happen. You put your system in in waves, you'll probably replace it in waves. But in general, if you took all of this and kind of averaged it, uh, we want to make sure that we're putting in enough money to kind of make that happen over time. Another concept that's really important is whether a dollar is a dollar. So this is a capital dollar and this is an operational dollar. So we call these CapEx and this OpEx. So is the dollar the same that you spend on capital as operational? And for asset management to be working at its peak efficiency, they would be the same. In the US, they are not. People do not view those the same. Outside funders can fund capital and inside funders, meaning your customers or your city budget, whatever, property taxes, whatever method you use to pay for something, funds the OPEX. So we don't equate those the same. We really are a little bit more on the CAPEX side. We like to spend dollars on new stuff so we can get that really good state and federal funding. Um, so it is just something to keep in mind that they're not always equal and it will impact how asset management performs and maybe make it just slightly less efficient than places where the value of the two is the same. So in long-term funding, we wanna consider the full cost life cycle of the assets, ensure replacement cycle is appropriate, fund full cost of operations and make sure that as much as possible, the dollar in operations is the same as capital. So just a few words on the human element, people and culture. Um, asset management is a thought process, not a technology program. So people do matter. People are not assets using our traditional sense. And we don't want to think of them as something you own that has value because you don't want to own your people. 
but they're super, super important. And I think that the most critical element to whether asset management will succeed or not is whether your people are on board. Um, so all of those decisions that are made rely on humans. Um, so I kind of liken people to sort of this spectrum. There are people who will oppose asset management. There's nothing you can do. Um, and for the most part, they just have to be removed from the organization, as sad as that is to say. But there are people who will do everything in their power to make it fail. They don't have any ability to be trained. Um, and so hopefully there's very few and you can address them. The next level up is people who are maybe skeptical, but you can convince them. If you show them real data, if you show them how it helps them, they will come on board. Those people are fine. We can work with those people. And then there are people who believe in asset management. They're going to champion it, but they're okay. You know, they get it. Um, and hopefully a lot of your people fall in here, you know, given the right incentives and, and um, equipment, training, et cetera, they'll get on board. And then you have your champions, your champions who are actually going to be out there saying, this is great. We need to do this. Um, so it's really important to have those champions, but remembering that asset management is everybody's job. So we really do need employees to understand asset management benefits and see how they specifically benefit. Um, again, I always think asset management has to be a win for everybody. It's not just a win for um, upper management or regulators or whoever, it's a win for the employees too. So there should be some benefits that employees can get. It should also fit the culture of the organization um, because it is a behavior change and it's going to require some changes to occur, which means that the best, it, you know, the better it fits the culture of how people are used to doing things and the less it's kind of foreign to people. Um, like, for example, the type of technology you use. Um, if you're used to everybody uses phone, cell phones to do things, well, then you want your asset management program to also make use of that cell phone technology. And instead of giving them an extra device or saying, well, no, we're using tablets or we're using laptops. You know, if people are used to using a certain thing, fit your program to what they're used to doing and they're more likely to you know, be compliant. So with that, that was the whirlwind tour through um, gray asset management. And I just wanted to spend, you know, just a very few minutes just talking about uh, where we are in the gray world with asset management implementation. Um, back when I started in the early 2000s, you know, with asset management pretty heavily and that sort of thing, um, it was new to everybody and I got yelled at a whole bunch. I mean, that was my life. Um, everybody was yelling at me. Why are you talking about this? We already do too much. You're just adding to my workload. And I say, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm trying to do. I am not trying to add to your workload. I'm trying to do the exact opposite. I'm trying to make your workload better. Um, and I figure like the real implementation of asset management happened about 2010 to 2012. And I just based it on the fact that I got yelled at a whole lot less starting in 2010. And then I wasn't yelled at anymore by 2012. So my progress was kind of like pushing that boulder up the hill. And I kind of felt like we were getting towards the top by about 2010, 2011. But there was a good, I don't know, eight to 10 years of massive pushing that boulder up the hill and being kind of a lone voice for a long time. Um, so I kind of feel like there's a transition that will take place as well with green assets um, because it took us a long time to get where we are and we are nowhere near full adoption of asset management in the gray world. We're not even remotely close to that. Uh, we still have large utilities. Um, in fact, I have a couple of clients now that are large utilities that you would think, hey, they're doing great. They don't need help. Sure they do. <laughs> they're still struggling with various aspects of asset management. You know, How do we do certain things? Or the one I mentioned that has 12,000 assets um, that's not sustainable. So how do you go from that to maybe a better, more sustainable approach? And I mentioned that we're going to help CNMI with asset management. So there's still a lot to be done in gray world. And, and um, I did a talk actually for um, a conference, virtual conference um, a couple of months ago where I said it's the glass half empty, glass half full. So when I look backwards, I see a glass half full. I feel like we've made a ton of progress because I can see where we were and where we are today. When I look forward, the glass is half empty. 
because we have so much more we can do. We are way behind some other countries like Australia and New Zealand with our practice of asset management compared to theirs. Um, we are not world's best by any stretch of the imagination, but I think we'll get there. I mean, I feel like we're picking up steam. There's new regulations like the America Water Infrastructure Act that is requiring states to look at asset management and use it, at, like promote it and build it into their capacity development strategies. And there's now funding through some different acts where you can do training for water and wastewater systems. Um, maybe it is lagging a little bit in the stormwater side of things. And I, I think that will happen too, but I think it just is gonna take us a while to get there. So we're, we're partway where we need to be, uh, but my main reason for sharing that is to say that in the green world, we might feel a little bit behind, but I think it's because the progression in the gray world took a long, long time and we forget how long it was and how negative everybody felt about it when it first came. So some of that is going to happen in the green world and it's going to take us a little while to push the boulder up the hill in green. Um, but it's important to remember that that's what we had to do in gray. So we're just going to go through a similar progression and, um, uh, you know, just over time, we'll see um, improvements and that kind of thing. So um, let's see. Um, do we have questions, Don, that didn't get answered in the chat? I think I've addressed most of them in the chat. Um, the question that just came in, I just put a quick uh, sentence answer. It's a it's a much bigger answer and discussion, um, but the the question is about the benefits of of trees. It's the co benefits kind of question of adding trees, and um, you know I think where we've landed is that in fitting green into gray, <laughs> that the co benefits really fall out in level of service. Um, you know there are gray assets that have more than one benefit. And they have therefore more than one level of service goal, or they might have more than one purpose, which is essentially what a co-benefit could be, is that we're putting this in because its purpose is to handle stormwater, but also provide shade or address air quality or, you know, so those purposes can be multiple for gray and they can be multiple for green. So you might have um, you know, a, a, a storm uh, or a, a sewer line that um, obviously is meant to remove sewage pipe, but where you place it might have another purpose um, to avoid drinking water lines or to allow for um, high speed internet lines to be run at the same time or, you know, so that would be a second purpose or a co benefit. Um, and we haven't ever really talked about it in the gray world, but it's super important in the green world. And so defining that purpose in level of service, when there's more than one purpose for this asset, um, we're going to have to define that in our level of service goals. So if the purpose of the asset is to capture stormwater and improve air quality, then you've got two level of service goals that you need to be measuring and meeting at all times. And when you start to see that to deteriorate or to change, then that's when the maintenance um, changes, the replacement process comes into place. So level of service is really where co-benefits fit into gray asset management and that discussion. Um, and we talked a lot about co-benefits and how do you quantify them or how do you get them uh, pulled into the conversation or how do we um, highlight those benefits and I think that where personally where I've landed from all of the learning I've done from you guys is that we stop calling them co-benefits and we start calling them purposes and we start set, setting level of service goals around them um, so that if we're putting in green infrastructure to accomplish one thing we're probably not going to sell it very well but if we're putting in green infrastructure to accomplish six things, then we can probably sell it a lot easier. So those level of service goals really become super important. And we have been trying to convince the gray world that level of service is important, important, important and setting those goals. And I don't know how many 
people skip it altogether or don't even put it in their, their core components of asset management or ever discuss it. Um, but I think green infrastructure is really going to highlight the importance of having the level of service conversation. And what are we really trying to accomplish and how do we do that most efficiently? And then green infrastructure comes, you know, and it, it kind of falls on a level playing field where we've seen it struggle um, to be compared to gray equally. So that's a much longer explanation than my one sentence, but I wanted to give it a little bit of time. Um, we've had a couple of people ask if we can provide the PowerPoints and I've said that we can. I think we need to talk with Christina about the best way to do that. So absolutely we'll share them, but we need to figure out the best platform. Um, emailing PowerPoints sometimes is not that effective. So it will not work in this case at all. Or, way higher than the number of, you put two photographs <laughs> in and you exceed the, the size of most uh, email programs. So sharing through like some kind of SharePoint or Google Docs or some other method is probably what we need um, to be able so to. We'll just chat with Christina about that and then we'll contact you all and let you know where you can find it um, as soon as we've had a chance to wrap this up, what the best method is. Um, so that's just kind of an announcement that yes, we're willing to share uh, the PowerPoints and uh, we are recording the presentation. Yeah. I assume that we can host the presentation and share a link of it to um, unless we are told otherwise by uh, the powers that be. So, <laughs> um, and Heather, the questions are rolling in. So I will- And Emily had put her hand up. So I just wanted to get to Emily real quick. Oh, I was just gonna say that this is being recorded and that would probably oh. be the best way to share the presentation. Yeah, and we're happy to do I'm that. It. Thank you. <laughs> um, and we have a question about, one of the questions we're struggling with is the scale at which to define assets on complex sites. So for example, on a 60 plus acre urban natural area that was designed for flood storage mitigation, obviously the entire site is an asset, but it's also made up of multiple components, a riparian forest corridor, several wetlands, other vegetated areas, a trail and bridge, culverts, water control structure, should each of these components be designated as an asset for purposes of setting level, level of service, evaluating risk and assessing condition? So I would say that look at how you will manage it as your guiding force um, for green assets especially. So if you are actually managing the um, assets at a pretty micro level, so let's say we take culverts. Um, so you have, let's assume there's 20 culverts in this area that you're talking about, just to pick a number. And you're going to go to each of those culverts and you're going to do work and you want to track how many times you had to go and you want to track what you did when you were there and you want to, because you want to have cost information of how much time I'm spending on culverts or maybe they were designed differently and you want to see how much time differently designed culverts take because maybe that will tell you in the future, this is a better design than that one. So in that case, you really need to have every culvert in your system because you're gonna manage it at that micro level. Now, when you're talking about the riparian corridor, that might be a little different because maybe you're not really gonna do specific activities on parts of the corridor. You're just kind of kind of inspect it, you know, make sure nothing's going wrong. You could have that whole corridor as one single asset if you're managing it more that way. Then you can look at vegetation and say, well, again, how do I manage the vegetation part? Am I managing that like on a per acre type of basis where I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some kind of, you know, weeding or replanting or, and I'm just going to send somebody out there and they're going to do it like a whole big chunk at a time. So you could design your asset that way. So maybe like, oh, five acre chunks or one acre chunks. So you want to have enough assets to give you the information you need to make decisions, but not so many that you're just going crazy trying to collect data. So like, for example, if the forest had, you know, 100,000 trees, like clearly you don't want 100,000 trees in your inventory. That would be insane. So you would just want to know, well, there's 30 acres that's forested, like that would be good enough. So you could either have one asset that's 30 acres of forest or you could have maybe 30 assets over one acre of forest, but I probably would not go a whole lot deeper than that because 
you'll just go insane. So again, it's sort of that balance of having enough to be able to make decisions you want to make, you know, having information, but not so many that you're going to go insane trying to just manage the sheer bulk, you know, in the number of assets that you're going to have. And things like the trail and the bridges, you probably are maintaining those, like those would be good assets, but maybe the bridge only needs to be one asset and not lots of little assets. Or maybe the trail needs to only be, you know, if there's three or four trails that intersect, like each trail could be an asset. So, you know, trail A, trail B, trail C, trail D, but we don't have to break it into like the first five feet of the trail and the next five feet, because that would get a little crazy. So it's usually thinking about how you're gonna maintain it, how you're gonna make decisions and then break the asset down small enough to let you make those decisions, but not so small that you're going crazy with just managing gobs and gobs of data. Did we, um, did I miss any other questions that came in? Um, somebody wrote in about sustainable material standards for construction. Um, that's a really good, concept again going back to that construction and part of the assets life i think for green assets you know as much as gray i won't say more so because i think it's really important for gray too but that that construction approach you use really matters like how they're dealing with the soil how they're doing the plantings you know i've talked to enough people who say, well, we didn't really know what we were doing. We hired a company, they didn't know how to do the planting. We didn't really know how to tell them to do it either. And it wasn't done right. So thinking about standards for how you want something done so that even if you don't own it, even if you're not gonna maintain it, if it's gonna be part of your overall system, you want similar standards. And that is done in the gray world too. Like a development might be being put in and they're putting in say water pipe or sewer pipe and that's gonna connect up at one point to the system. And they don't want substandard materials being put in even if they're not owning and maintaining them, even if it's always gonna be the development's problem, it will eventually be the city's problem because eventually the failure there is gonna cause a failure in the larger utility. So they typically have standards and they'll say, you can put in your own sewers, but they must follow these standards. It must be this type of pipe at these slopes and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that they're not like in my neighborhood here, the developer put in a whole bunch of really crappy pipe. And so there are breaks constantly in our drinking water system because it was really crappy pipe. And the city wouldn't even allow such pipe to be put in today but that's where that construction standard I think really matters and you're telling people even for the assets you don't own how you want it to be done. Uh, let's see. Um, are there any plans to standardize green infrastructure sites and components to reduce costs? I sure hope so. <laughs> I sure hope that's where the industry goes. Similarly again to gray if we look at the evolution from gray you know, like standardizing things, like how things are constructed, how they're made, how they're installed, does give you a cost benefit. Um, you know, when I was doing the traditional engineering world and I was designing stuff, we designed two absolutely identical treatment plants because the company we were working for, it was that business, but they wanted two plants. One was in Ohio, one was in Wisconsin. And they said, hey, how much could we save if you design the exact same plant <laughs> at this place and this place? Well, they saved a ton because there were only you know, slight variations between the plants. Uh, they were both uh, the same type of manufacturing facility. So our company designed two identical things, saved them a ton of money. So there are a lot of cost savings to be had if we can get some sort of standard designs around how somebody's doing something. And I think over time, we want to build that. I, you know, we're probably not there yet, but a lot of places are kind of trial and erroring a little bit when you talk to them like, well, we wish we wouldn't have done it this way. We wish we would have done it that way, uh, but it's too late, it's already put in. But in the future, we don't have to do things the same. So what we learn, we hope we could share and you know, maybe have some designs that are a little bit more standard. You could always, you know, customize them, but having the basics be standard, I think would be a really good idea. Um, Heather, just let me add to that real quick. The different systems are developing standard designs for internal use. Um, and some are sharing them, you know, on their websites and things so that you can access them. 
Um, but of course, what we've learned too is that standard designs oftentimes require small changes. So it does, just like your example, save cost, but they're not going to work every situation, every time, and location can be very impactful. So we, you know, we um, have been given the example of what type of road is the tree uh, infiltration basin, you know, structure beside? Is it beside an interstate? Or is it beside a residential, you know, low, low flow, low traffic flow, not water flow, <laughs> um, you know, and so that could impact the design, obviously, for something that has the same purpose, it may not have the same um, overall design. So while there, there, I think standardization is happening, um, it's also not going to to be a perfect fit for every example. So there are designs out there and um, there, some of them are, are listed in the resources section of the framework that we're sharing. More and more systems are starting to, to pull them together. And we hope to be able to continue to add to that list um, in the framework resources. So, you know, if you're interested, we can definitely kind of share some of those that we've seen with you as well. And there was one put into the chat. I'm not positive if that's one we have in our document yet, but there was a example put in there. And we'll definitely check that to see if we can add that to our um, resources. Um, somebody asked if the um, examples of how the public has been involved in determining levels, levels of service. And this is one that when done right, um, New Zealand is probably the leading people in the entire world for how to do it really well you would bring the customers into the conversation all along and they have a process every three years they have to do it here in the us it's a little trickier we're not used to doing customer engagement so a lot of times it's focus group type stuff where you bring customers together in a focus group and ask them questions surveys that people do where they'll send surveys out and get customer feedback that way uh, smaller systems have done like an annual meeting to try to get customer feedback. Um, other things you want to look at are customer complaints and how is that going up or down based on what you're doing. Um, but it's, it is a trickier thing to do here, but the biggest one I've seen is the focus group approach where you try to get random customers to come in and oftentimes incentivized by, you know, $10 Starbucks gift card or uh, some break on your bill or, you know, some way to try to entice them to want to come to your meeting. Um, there's also some people have advisory groups. The only sort of thing to watch there is to make sure all voices are represented on the advisory group and not just, you know, those couple of customers that care and everybody else is sort of left out of the picture. So as long as your advisory group is sort of more, um, uh, all encompassing that works really well. Um, anybody on from Cincinnati's water program? If you are, just chat in and say yes. Um, but Cincinnati has a really interesting one um, where they they had um, I forget how many neighborhoods, but I mean the number is not important. Let's just say it was thirty. I don't remember what it was, but like thirty distinct neighborhoods in the city of Cincinnati, and they sent employees pre-pandemic, um, they would send employees to particular spots once a month. So it was libraries, grocery stores, um, community centers, you know, could be anywhere. It could be the Walmart. And they would give them some time off in the afternoon. Um, so once a month, like say on a Wednesday afternoon at, at four or whatever time it was, I'm going to be here and I'm going to talk water and I'm going to be here for two hours. Any water issue you have, you may come to me and I will answer it, I'll figure it out. And it included everybody from the top of the organization on down. Like, so one person who lived in those areas would do it once a month. And that was a great way for them to get customer feedback. And the customers kind of got used to it. At first it was like, what the heck are you guys doing? But after a while, <laughs> they would kind of get to know, like they could say anything. And they, she was telling me, the head of the organization was telling me they could talk about my bill. You know, I understand why are you billing me this much? And she could have a conversation with the customer. Well, this is why the bill is so high and this is what it includes. And so, you know, that was another good way to kind of engage customers. Um, and so I think in the interest of time, um, 
are we able to go without a break or do you guys need five minutes? So if you could chat, um, break, yes or no, just chat a yes or no, whether we should take a short break. Um, we've got one yes. Okay, we've got some yeses. Let's just take five and then we'll come back and Don can share the framework when we come back. Yeah, so, and we have more time at the end to address some of the questions that are still in the chat. So don't worry, we will get to them. Uh, but coming back at 40, 12, 40, 1, 40, 10, 40, wherever you are. <laughs> 40 after whatever hour you happen to be on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's okay. take a break and uh, we will come back. Okay, so I think just in the interest of time, we're going to keep on rolling, but for the next about 20 minutes, um, Don and I are going to discuss how we integrated green into the traditional asset management framework and also show you the website and the framework that we've created, um, some of the cool features, and then we'll leave the remaining 40 to 30 minutes open for questions about the framework or if you would like Heather to go back and address any of her asset management slides. I know that was a lot to put into one hour. Sometimes we do six to eight hour trainings in person just on that. So any of those questions are welcome. And Melinda, we can start with yours once we go back to questions because I don't want to get lost in the chat there. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, Dawn, are you able to see? I am. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to start with how we got to where we are today. I know some of you have been part of this project with us for a while, so it'll be a little bit of review, but for those of you who are new to us, um, we thought it was important that you understood how we got to the framework and where it is today. So we started a project with Springpoint Partners about two years ago to integrate green infrastructure into the traditional gray asset management framework. And it's a three year project altogether. And we just started year three. And so in year two, um, we really wanted to get up to date on where green infrastructure was. We have a long history of traditional asset management um, but we were a little bit less familiar with green. So we spent the first year of the project really researching green infrastructure, going to conferences, talking to professionals in the field. And that included not just utilities, but also consultants, landscape architecture folks, people from universities uh, all around the country to get a broad idea of where people were at with green infrastructure. And then through all those connections, we decided that it'd be great if we could meet in person for uh, what we call a convening, which happened in February 2020 at the very end of our first year of the project and before the world changed. Um, but we flew people out to Albuquerque to have a day and a half long conversation about some of the questions that we had as we had been researching green infrastructure and how it would fit into asset management. And as Heather mentioned, we didn't want to change the framework just because for the last 20 years, people have worked so hard to get asset management accepted. So our big challenge was how do you fit green into it? Because it's definitely not perfect, um, but we don't want to reinvent the wheel because it's taken 20 years to get where we are right now with asset management. So we had the convening and um, we invited about 30 people from around the country, different green infrastructure uh, experts, some folks in asset management, and we broke up into different groups for each core component of asset management and asked them different questions. They were fairly broad, some are on the screen here, um, but we had a whole list and we tried to have different groups just to get some of our basic questions answered that maybe weren't necessarily obvious in our research. We also found oftentimes that there were some conflicting opinions or conflicting views. So the goal of this convening was really to get an overall broad understanding and a consensus if possible um, from folks in the green infrastructure world. And so that was really year one. And then with year two, we took the answers to all of those questions and we started trying to put them into this framework. And along the way, what we realized is that it would be very useful 
uh, since we had done a ton of research in year one to compile all of that research and put it into a database. And that's actually one of the tools that will be available on the website in this framework as well. But because we had done such basic and thorough research on different green assets, the construction, the O&M, we thought systems, especially systems who either don't have green infrastructure yet or just starting out, that this would be a great resource for them to go to to just get basic information. Or if they needed to talk to the community or elective leaders about green infrastructure and the O&M or the costs associated with it, then they could go to this database and easily filter through this information where we had to go to several different websites, conferences, et cetera, to get it all. So currently it's being built, it's close to done, but if you look at the blue squares here, those are all different fields. And so the first one we have is asset type. And we decided through our first convening that we were going to include a pretty broad definition of green assets. So in our case, when we're talking about green infrastructure, and green assets, what we include in the framework, as well as in the database, um, refers to any practice that uses or replicates the function of natural systems to achieve a desired outcome. Um, and this often provides multiple benefits. So we have a large list of assets and it's definitely growing. We're gonna be adding to it, but then we have a brief description of how that asset works. We also created these rankings on ease or difficulty of construction. And these are all based on um, the other assets in the system. So there's no specific defin definition, but a five would be very hard. A one would be very easy relative to the other assets that we have in that database. And then we have the O&M required as well as how is O&M done. Again, that's a ranking system. We also wanted to talk about design considerations as Dawn mentioned and Heather mentioned, this is very site specific, but just to give everybody a general idea of what they should be considering with those specific type of types of assets. And then the potential benefits, this is great for community outreach or talking to board members or elected officials. We also have a very broad overview of costs. Of course, that's going to change depending where you are. Um, but to give people an idea of how expensive or not expensive certain types of green assets would be. And then we have infrastructure type. So in this case, natural, that would be something like wetlands or forests. And then we have enhanced or engineered. So you can filter by that as well. And then finally, we have water classification. And by that, we mean what that asset is impacting. So if the asset's benefiting source water protection, or if it's hel uh, helping stormwater management, wastewater management, combined sewers, et cetera. So this is in the works and it came out of all of our research in uh, year one, and it will be part of our framework very soon. Um, and we think that we have a pretty comprehensive list of assets. We did discuss with folks at the first convening um, what assets that they should if we were missing any, if we should add any. So as that comes out, if you have any other suggestions, we're of course open to it. Um, and then we had a second convening at the end of year two. So after we started writing the framework and after we created this, um, let me just admit Corey, uh, after we created this uh, database that really narrowed down our general questions and of course, we wish that this could have been in person, but it had to be online. So instead of doing a day and a half Zoom that everyone would absolutely hate, we decided to break up uh, into three hour sessions and each one addressed a different component. And these questions were much more targeted because we had just been through a year of writing out the framework. And so these questions were a little bit more specific to some lingering questions that we had. So that happened this January and the very beginning of February. And so we incorporated uh, those last minute changes into what Dawn is gonna present to you, which is an online format of our framework. Um, and what next? So we're just started uh, year three. And our kind of final round of what we'd like to do is we're working with GILE members to 
beta test the framework for specific green assets. And obviously we want their feedback of what worked, what didn't work. Are there any areas that are a little bit uh, unclear to them? And then we're also gonna be talking to other systems as well. Um, there we go, other systems as well, if they would like to beta test. And then we're gonna incorporate those changes. And ultimately we would like to create training material with this framework, um, it's a living document. So we're always gonna be adding resources, adding photos, um, anything that you wanna provide that you think would be relevant to those resources, please send it over. We would definitely appreciate it. Um, but with that, that's what year three looks like. And hopefully we can do a final rollout presentation of the framework at the end of year three. Um, but with that, I think Dawn, if you want to start sharing your screen. Uh, Sounds good. Okay. There we go. All right. I am. And before Dawn goes, there was a question for you, Haley. Oh, let me. And um, it was Haley, you mentioned you'll be talking to other systems as well. Could you share more about that? Yeah, so there's a, a couple systems that we had invited to our convening year one that I believe are not part of GILE, but said that they would be interested in also beta testing the approach. So we haven't reached out to them to formally set that up yet, but ideally we're going to kind of see how the process goes with folks from GILE and the more feedback we can get, the better. So if anybody's on who is not part of that project specifically, please feel free to reach out. Um, we want to distribute this as widely as possible and try it with as many assets as possible. And there's one other question that came in um, about lifespan, whether that related to maintenance frequency or inspection frequency. And it's kind of a little different whether it's a gray or green asset because they function slightly differently. So if we're talking about a, a gray asset, we're talking about the time from today until you've had like a major um, uh, potential or functional failure. So you have to intervene with a repair, rehabilitation, replacement. With green assets, it could be a little bit different. So it could be if you're talking about like a major maintenance that has to be done, like and you do it every, you know, 20 years. And if you do it every 20 years, you basically forever and ever can have that green, um, you know, trees or plants or whatever there. Um, in that case, the maintenance frequency might be a better bet. But if it's um, something like where you're going out and doing maintenance once a month to clean out trash, that's not what we're talking about. So it would be one like a major redo. Um, so whether that means like we're going to go in and do like a super major maintenance thing. I, I remember somebody was talking about taking soil out of the bottom, for example, that the soil had a certain life. So once you put it in the green, um, your green infrastructure setting, the clock kind of started ticking. And at some point, I don't remember precisely the number of years, but let's say 20 or 25 years later, <coughs> they know they needed to come in, remove the soil, put new soil in, put the plants back. So you could call that if you wanted to, like the useful life, at least of the soil. And if you wanted to, like that, that whole green asset could be considered like that would match a lifespan. So there's a little bit of flexibility of how you wanna term the lifespan, but you definitely don't wanna do it um, you know, like super short for like mini maintenance. You'd want it to be for a pretty big thing that's going on. Uh, for a forest, if you do say thinning, you know, maybe that could be the cycle because forests, you know, we don't really think of a forest like having a useful life that, you know, 100 years from now is not going to be a forest anymore unless you know it's being removed. But if it's meant to stay forested, um, we kind of think of that as almost like an indefinite life. So then you could put it on like a thinning activity. Like, oh, we do a thinning every 50 years or every 75 years or something like that. So trying to think of ways to equate to a useful life when you're talking about natural assets um, or green assets might be just slightly different than how we think of the useful life of a gray asset. All right, so we're gonna spend just a few minutes kind of highlighting some of the aspects of the online framework. 
for integrating green into the gray asset management world. Um, so I just wanted to start with the home page, the landing page, um, and point out that the table of contents is always here, um, but it does go into, it does drill down and go into the different core components. Um, and you can use the search box if you're looking for a specific resource or um, you know, a, a, a particular word, um, it, you can use the search box, it is functional. And, um, so the table of contents is really where um, you will navigate from core component to core component. Once you're in a core component, um, the table of contents will change or the menu will change. Um, so some of the things that I wanted to point out are when you get into uh, the individual core components or the um, only one that's not a core component is the introduction. Um, you can see the menu has changed and um, at the top we have breadcrumbs. So you can use the breadcrumbs to get back to where you were um, or you can see where you're at or you can link to where you're at if you're trying to share something. So the breadcrumbs are really useful in um, kind of navigating and moving around the document as well. Uh, so some of the things I wanted to show you uh, in the introduction, um, you know, we're trying to explain the use of the framework um, and then talk a bit about what asset management is, the benefits of asset management, and then why we wanted to blend green into gray. So we tried to incorporate uh, a variety of imagery here that moves with the text um, that's from kind of the three different worlds um, of water. And then we in our asset management overview, overview, we wanted to make sure that we've called out the um, circular nature of asset management. And these are active links that do take you to each of the core components. Um, and then also to bring in our asset management IQ, which is a baseline tool, uh, helps you to establish where you're currently at in the process of asset management, but also allows you to track your progress over time. Uh, so that this link helps uh, take you directly there. So that's kind of the, the key point I wanted to make there. We wanted to show you um, where we did pull in here, asset management benefits. We did pull in some of the videos from the previous version of the asset management manual. So they are going to be primarily gray related, um, but the benefits of asset management tend not to change regardless of what type of um, asset it is. Uh, so we just wanted to, to show that these are still worthwhile and useful, and there are lots of benefit discussions here from systems of all sizes, Picacho being maybe one of the smallest, um, you know, and then we've got some bigger systems with Columbus being probably the largest in the list. Uh, and then the blending green and gray, we bring out the discussion about why we felt it was important, some of what Haley just discussed. Um, and then the imagery here, is where green and gray have been integrated <laughs> intentionally. So it's a wastewater treatment plant, or sorry, a stormwater treatment plant um, that's also a park. And the information on this, um, this infrastructure is, is quite interesting to read about as well. So those are uh, just a few bits of, of introduction I wanted to point out. And then if we go to level of service, Haley, can you just nod at me if my screen's changing as I'm changing tabs, because I'm not positive. Yes. <laughs> Thank <is>. you. <laughs> so, because sometimes it does, and sometimes you have to stop sharing and resharing. So, I just wanted to make sure it's not hanging out on the. <laughs> um, so, with level of service, what we kind of wanted to point out is we've tried to make the framework interactive in a lot of ways and uh, inviting in a lot of ways. So, we've incorporated imagery, uh, we've incorporated some videos. And as you can see here, the, the video here is highlighting some of the benefits um, of developing level of service goals. Uh, so that's just uh, a brief area there. And then we tried to make it interactive in some ways too. So we have in the mission statement, um, we've introduced kind of a little game where you get to guess whose mission statement it is. And the reason this is here is strictly to point out how important it is to have a mission statement um, that is concise, but clearly defines who you are. So you read the mission statement and you try to guess whose it is. And then to see if you got it right, you just mouse over it and you get to see the answer. Um, so some things like that, that help to uh, draw you in and to um, also provide clear examples of why we want to have 
uh, what's shown or what's written in the text above. Um, and then we move on to current state of the assets. And this is a place we'd really like to incorporate more imagery for green infrastructure. Um, but this is uh, talking about the condition of your assets. And the picture here is a before and after. So you can see when you mouse over it, it obviously says that rehabilitation has been completed. But not only does that happen, you can move the slider bar and you can see the entire before image and the entire after image. And what I'd really like to, um, to, to be able to do is to show some of the before and after, but maybe not rehabilitation um, before and after, but construction before and after, why green infrastructure is really benefited. Um, so whether it's, you know, extending a sidewalk um, or, you know, extending the, the, the green areas along a sidewalk to help with visibility for bus stops or, you know, how that changes when it was just a curb, but now there's some green infrastructure and how it increases visibility for a bus stop or any of those types of before and afters. Um, you know, we have some images where um, before when they were communicating uh, with the community, they would draw in chalk where the new infrastructure was going to be and what it would take up of the streets and that kind of thing. Um, so if you have imagery like that, we'd really like to use it to demonstrate, um, you know, some before and after concepts. So that's just uh, one example of, you know, the capabilities here. Um, and I think that one of the neatest things is that their sample tap here went down into a bucket um, and that was completely taken away and they have a new sample tap and a port up here. So it's much cleaner with chlorine and all that good stuff. Um, so just some, you know, some neat concepts there to share. Um, and then we have things like um, tables that expand. So if you're interested in the content, you're welcome to expand it. Um, but if you aren't interested in the content, you don't have to spend the time reading through it to get to the next section. So here, how do you create asset ID numbers? If it's something that you're already accomplished and you don't really need to read about, you can kind of skip on past it. But if you're really interested in learning more, um, you can click on it and it expands and it gives you more information. And then anything that's blue is an active link that takes you to even more information or further into the concepts of the, or further into the core concepts um, of asset management. So those um, are some of the ways that we've, um, you know, tried to make it, you read what you want to know about without having to browse the whole, or read, you know, from cover to cover, that kind of information. Did I hear someone? Sorry, Don, that was me. Uh, really quick, Pam, I saw that you had raised your hand, so I wasn't sure if it was a question pertaining to what she's showing right now, because I wanted to get you. You're muted, Pam. <laughs> All right, thanks. Every meeting, right? Someone's got to exactly, do it. Oh, exactly. <laughs> I do it almost every day. Uh, <laughs> I, I was actually going to ask a question about something else. So if you want to finish what you're doing, we can go back to it. Um, yeah, if you don't mind to keep it in mind, and then we'll just open it up sure. to discussion. Mm -hmm. We can go wherever we need to, um, if that's all right with you. OK. Um, so criticality is the next core component. Um, and here, you know, we wanted to point out that not all, all assets are equally important. That's why you want to determine which assets are high risk and which assets are not. And so to try to convey that message a little bit more clearly, we put in images of all different types of assets and, you know, trying to think about how would you compare one to another? Well, you can't easily compare one to another if you don't do a risk assessment, if you don't look at probability of failure and consequence of failure. So, um, you know, just some imagery to help understand the importance. Um, and then we have also some visualization tools here that help, um, which is what was in, some, very similar to what's in Heather's presentation to help you understand what's in the text. So reading the text sometimes maybe isn't as clear as having the pictures, you know? So we added the visualization, um, some information on what your overall risk graph might look like, what your overall risk tables could look like, things of that nature. And then finally, with life cycle costing, um, we have information, um, you know, about what life cycle looks like, 
And then, um, you know, that most of the time we focus on, on the purchase price and that's not necessarily sufficient. Uh, so this imagery is just to communicate that, why it's important to do life cycle costing. Um, and then we define that much more clearly what those phases are. Um, and again, with similar imagery to what you saw in the presentation today with similar descriptions. So if you aren't able to attend a training, hopefully you still get the same communication, like you still get the same lesson. Um, and then we have um, one last little um, video that I just wanted to share with you that I think adds to, and then I'm gonna show you a couple of examples and we'll open it wide up to questions. So here we go. So this is just a video um, that we thought kind of added to the idea of, you know, what you might be doing when you're repairing, but also, um, you know, using the title on the video, again, just to draw you in and communicate what, um, where you're at in the core components and what you're, what you should be learning about. So just a, a fun uh, visual to, you know, help communicate where we're at again. Some specific examples I wanted to share. Um, where we gave examples for green versus gray. Uh, so it is um, called out specifically. Some places we did not have to make very specific um, call outs for green and other places we did. So for example, with level of service goals, we gave goal examples for gray and goal examples for green um, to give some uh, idea of what you might want to be writing or how you might want to write them. Uh, and then if we go to uh, our criticality section, and this is kind of peppered throughout, I just wanted to give you a few examples um, where we calculate criticality. We have, again, examples here, um, and we have two gray examples. So we have a chlorinator pump, we have pipe replacement, and we have two green examples. So we have source water uh, surrounded by a forest, and we have uh, bioretention system. Uh, so we give examples of how you might go about assessing the, the risk for each of those types of assets. And then finally, the third call out that I wanted to make was just um, in the current state of the assets. Uh, we have some examples of what constitutes an asset. And so this was where, this is when Heather was saying, you have to figure out how you're going to define that asset. And it can be by cost or it can be by um, maintenance or it can, you know, it's your, it's up to you to decide what, how you define an asset. Um, so we gave some examples of how an asset might be defined. Um, and we do have a gray and a couple of green. Uh, and then we have those criteria in that accordion type expandable table so that you can choose to read about it or not. Um, and then as you continue through, we follow through, we carry through these examples throughout uh, the current state discussion. So those are just some examples of what's here, some of the content, some of the places that we were very specific with green examples versus gray examples um, and, and uh, how to navigate. We really um, hope that you guys had some time to preview this and uh, if we want to open it up to your questions and let us know, um, you know, your thoughts, your questions, your comments, your concerns. We are here um, at this point to, to listen to you guys. And of course, uh, we can let this run for a period of time and then we can try and go back and capture the questions about asset management in general. Um, and if we do not, um, we can definitely address that offline uh, via email as well if we don't get to every question we have today. So uh, fear not if we don't get to you today. <laughs> so at this time, I'm just gonna open it up to you guys um, for questions. And I have not been monitoring the chat, Heather. So I don't know if I need to answer anything specific. Um, um, I We had a chat about APWA, which I think we managed in the chat. Um, um, and then I think we mentioned the tool that Murdo um, pointed out, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, and I apologize if I'm not. Um, so I think we mentioned that. So let's go to Pam. I think Pam had a question. So let's go to Pam now. Thanks. <clears throat> so as you were talking, I 
I realized that the audience of this framework is going to be rather large because it seems like it, you know, you started with drinking water, wastewater. Uh, so anyone who goes to this tool could, could just be in the gray world and not know anything about green infrastructure or could just be in the green infrastructure world and not manage anything to do with the gray system. Am I correct in that? That is correct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And asset management as a framework is actually meant for any kind of assets mm -hmm. whatsoever, like not our specific one, we kind of honed in on water, uh, but asset management in general was never meant as like a utility specific kind of tool, but rather, you know, you can manage buildings or you could manage um, parks or libraries or, you know, actually in New Zealand, they manage cemeteries this way. Um, so it can be used for any type of assets. And in the business world, I go to conferences whenever I can that, that are asset management for companies. So you're talking like Starbucks or um, Boeing or, um, actually one workshop I was in, the guy who does cuties, you know, the little oranges, <laughs> they have a whole asset management program, who knew, to get cuties from trees into boxes and into the stores. Um, so this framework is meant as a thing that anybody could use. And our specific one is exactly as you described, like you could be gray, you could be green, you could be both. And one nice thing about maybe blending them is hopefully the gray people learn a little bit about green and hopefully green people learn a little bit about gray. So maybe we can start bridging that gap between the worlds of water, wastewater and stormwater so that we're remembering we're all the same team. Sometimes it feels like we forget that, that we're all on the same team. We're all trying to accomplish the same things. And you know, if we can try to start bridging that gap, that can be really helpful. And I'm just going back to the homepage while I'm sharing. I'll stop sharing here in just a minute, but just to make sure that everyone sees the web address, has the web address. Um, I think it's been emailed to you um, before the this meeting, but just to be sure, um, it's there on the screen and the um, and then I'll stop sharing here in a minute so we can open up the conversation more. I will try to chat that in. Uh, what is it, AMF? Oh, I can do it. I can just copy and paste it real yeah, quick. Yeah, if you can copy and paste that into the chat, then we'll, everybody will have it in case you're sitting at your computer, you're welcome to pull it up. Um, and one thing I did want to mention is we're always interested in adding to this one. I don't know, Don, if you thoroughly covered this, you probably already did. Um, but we want this to be breathing like constantly adding to it. And that's why we chose this format so that there is, you know, at a moment's notice, we can add something. Like somebody has a great case study, we can put it in here. Somebody has a really good resource, we can add it. Somebody has a new way to think about something, we can add a paragraph to the document without, you know, any fuss or muss. So um, we're always looking for things that you guys suggest, or even if there's a tool, you know, hey, it'd be great if there was a tool that did X, you know, let us know. And if there's a way that we can create it, or maybe somebody already did and we can share it, um, we're happy to do that. So, and photos, if you have photos that we can just pepper through the document, you know, we're happy to do that too. So just keeping in mind, um, you know, we wanted this to be something that could grow and change and, live over time so it is not just like okay here it is <laughs> we're done um whereas our previous document was not like this we really couldn't change it it was a written document that we sent out to people and that really prevented us from like hey we've got this great new thing we want to add a chapter well we'd have to recall every book and add a chapter or send everybody a supplement and it just wasn't conducive so this will we have no plans to create this in a paper format so it will just stay this document where you can click through and you can get resources you want. Um, so I think it'll be a lot handier for folks, um, you know, and for us to be able to add things. So as you get ideas, you know, have thoughts about things we can add or case studies or any of that kind of stuff, you know, we're happy to do it. We are crediting folks for images, so um, we want to make sure that you get credit for your image. So if there's anything that you want to share with us and you want us to, you know, make sure that the photo was credited to a certain department or a certain person or 
please let us know that and we will absolutely include it. I, I raised my hand, but I'll just go ahead and speak since no one else, I, I don't think anyone else is raising their hand. Uh, sorry if I, did I butt in line in front of everyone? No, no, no. go ahead, Pam. Okay. <laughs> I was curious, uh, as you know, as as it was mentioned by Haley and and Heather as well, that you know that our exchange is going to be testing this framework throughout the year. Um, a few of a few small cities through this grant collaboration process, and I'm I'm curious for those who are on the call who who work strictly with green infrastructure, if if anyone's willing to share how this sits with them if if they feel like they need more of something here or um, see any gaps or anything like that that maybe we can address during the year as we're beta testing it And at this, folk, at this point, folks, feel free to unmute. I don't think there's a need to use the chat. Um, so feel free to unmute and share your thoughts. And one thing that we've been hearing a lot through the, um, um, the convenings and just discussions that we've had with folks in general is kind of this, I don't mean to I don't mean to offend anybody by saying this, but sometimes green is like the ugly stepchild to gray. Um, and how do we, how do we bring green up to like a, you know, the same elevation? And that is one of our goals with this integrated framework that it is not thought of that way. That you have the whole wide array of options available to you. And you know, as like a stormwater utility or water utility, wastewater utility, that you're thinking so much more broadly than just like what are those pipes in the ground and what are the pumps that I have, but what are other options that I have to help my community and provide the service. So we're not trying to say like, oh, you need to sacrifice any performance, but rather, are there other ways to achieve the performance that maybe have other benefits? Um, and will help the community. We've been working with the community in Texas now through EPA where they have actually shown, or um, the universities that, it's not our university, but another university that's working with them has shown like a real cost savings to integrating this green infrastructure into their stormwater system. And they're trying to do some asset management with their green infrastructure, which is how we kind of got talking to them. Uh, but they're looking at it as beneficial in all kinds of ways that it is monetarily benefit, but it's also, you know, the environmental benefits of the stormwater reduction and quality changes and um, the co benefits that can happen. So I think one of our hopes is that we can elevate that discussion so that it's integrated. It's like you're looking at it as a whole instead of just the only thought that comes to my head is what are the what are the man made things I can do but rather what are the whole host of things I can do? So that's another goal of ours is just to open up, we hope, open up the discussion so things aren't 11 playing field. It doesn't mean you'll always pick green or always pick gray or always pick a combo, but at least it can be considered and it can be thought of instead of like sort of an afterthought. So that's one of our hopes too, is to just elevate that conversation. Hey Heather, it's Heidi from Vancouver. Um, thanks. The presentation has been really good. And I know I have other colleagues from Vancouver on the call here and some aren't as, um, you know, aware of asset management. So that's been helpful, but also some are from our gray infrastructure um, asset management group. So I'm really excited to speak with them afterwards. I think um, you're kind of, I like the examples you've put forward. I think that they're relatable for people in these spheres. And one thing that is of interest definitely is just on that elevating idea, like how do we convey the service that's provided by gray infrastructure and the benefit that that's gonna um, give to the gray infrastructure? So for example, um, you know, just like we're trying to get our numbers together to say, yeah, like absolutely these bio retention swales are providing drainage function all the time. And um, anyway, we're kind of still trying to work on that messaging, but um, 
that's going to be interesting. So right now I'm looking at your blending green and gray page and the website looks great by the way. Um, and I'm just trying to think of, you know, like right now it's a little bit of a, it seems like it's a sort of first steps, mm -hmm. but um, do you have some kind of uh, uh, concrete um, examples yet? Or do you have some ideas of where you wanna take that kind of blended idea? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely it's a little bit more conceptual at this point, just again, where we are in the process. I think um, we'll need to build some of those examples, but we certainly would like to do so. And if you're getting into those conversations, it might be worth, you know, having a conversation about even like what you've done in your process and how to share that kind of information. Um, because there may be some things in the gray world that would sort of correlate to the green world and we can kind of bring it over, which is what we're trying to do. Like anything that we've already sort of figured out, if you will, in the gray world and bringing that over to the green world is a good thing to do and vice versa. Things that occur in the green world that can be taken to the gray world. Um, somebody had mentioned about community involvement. There was a community in Iowa that had to put in water, wastewater and stormwater infrastructure. <clears throat> and there was none in that part of their town that was kind of like a forgotten piece of town and so they really worked hard with the customers and went street by street and said here are our various options let us explain them to you in a way that you understand let us show you pictures of what it will look like and the costs of different things and they actually picked a fairly green solution for the stormwater side cost a little bit more money took up space like from kind of that sidewalk edge of road area it was it was what they called bottomless manholes and so it, it infiltrated a lot of stormwater but it kept them from having to put as big a pipe in the center of the street and in almost every case the customers when they were given the options took that greener solution because they understood what they were going to get and even if it was presented as well it's slightly more expensive they or and it took up more space they liked the options better so i think finding ways to bring in customers to that conversation can also be helpful where they're the ones that are going to get some of those co-benefits so that it fits what they're wanting. Uh, some other community, I will not name, had put in some green infrastructure that didn't really fit what the community wanted and it kind of went awry. <laughs> and it doesn't look good now at all because like the community wasn't at all into that type of thing. Like it wasn't a place where they're gonna sit into in that green space, like that isn't how their community works. So maybe a different style of green infrastructure would have worked better. So I think having the community even involved in that conversation where they can help drive where the system goes like we really want you know these um uh, green um distributed green because we want our roads our streets to look better or we want some park areas so can we blend some green into parks and you know i think that can have a big impact on you know getting those customers to help drive decision making and you know what they want in the community Christina, you had raised your hand. Yeah, I was just going uh, back to the conversation about kind of what's next and curious about how uh, levels of service uh, impact, say, the setting of like minimum maintenance standards. So, you know, we have provincially regulated minimum maintenance standards that set, you know, when you need to clear your sidewalks and roads and uh, those are uh, funded and uh, kind of generally I would feel like very traditional for gray assets. So could eventually like a step be to, to establish these kind of minimum maintenance standards and regulate them in a way uh, for green infrastructure um, to accelerate the funding for operations and maintenance, which I, I, I see as a bottleneck as well or an issue. So curious if anybody's had thoughts or if that's already happening, um, just making the connection there. And I think that's another case where um, some standardization will make people a little bit more comfortable maybe because if you're going to take on green and you haven't done it before and especially if you're a department that's been very gray heavy and you're not familiar with like well what would i have to do if i had this particular type of green infrastructure what do i have to do you know is it a permeable pavement where i've got to sweep it is it a situation where i've got to take trash out of a um you know a green space or something 
So I think having some ideas, even if you're not going to adopt every exact thing, like, well, I'm going to do this every month, at least if you know what kind of maintenance you're getting into is really important. And we already have that a lot in the gray world that already exists. Like we know if you put a certain kind of pump in, this is what you have to do. If you put a certain kind of pipe in, this is what you have to do. You know, for manholes, this is what you have to do. And everybody tailors it, you know, to their own little needs, but they have some idea of what you have to do. And I think that was part of, you know, how you get comfortable with new gray assets. Well, it's also how you can get comfortable with new green assets. So I think over time, you know, it'd be good if that develops as part of the practice, you know, what you need to know about construction, what you need to know about maintenance, what you need to know about operations, you know, just sharing that information widely is to get that comfort level up. So people are willing to put it in, I think is really important. Um, I think actually with that, Heather, to uh, Melinda's question from uh, Melina, sorry about that, uh, it's a question from uh, the Gray presentation sort of relates to this. So I'm just going to read it to you really quick. Um, she's asking, are there standardized estimates of typ typical maintenance costs for different types of gray infrastructure over its lifespan? We often get asked for this for green infrastructure, and it'd be good to understand the differences for the different types of assets. You know, um, honestly, I don't think I've seen that. Um, Marie, why don't you comment? I see your hand going up, so maybe you have. So go ahead, go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, in Pima County, one of the things we discovered was a lot of the gray infrastructure was causing um, flooding conditions downstream. So our, our flood control district has been looking at using green infrastructure. And in the early stages, we were using um, cost benefit analyses to understand what were the uh, additional uh, uh, costs and benefits associated with these projects. And uh, we were working with a company called AutoCase and they were, but what their feedback to us in terms of the costs for the various per, um, features that would be installed were, it really varies by uh, the community because there could be people who have, um, access or they're right next to the place that makes these these materials uh, and another place you're going to have to ship it. Um, a lot of it had to do with um, that local economics. So it was really a locality specific information. You know, if you're doing earth moving and you've got a great big project where everyone's already working on that, then it's going to take a lot more money to get in the equipment to do um, the grading that you need to have done. So um, it is something that we're still looking at. We're starting to get our own local information, um, but it is, it's, it's definitely a really good question about how to get, how to get good cost information. The other thing I wanted to add was we were really surprised in when we were looking at the benefits for the life cycle costs was, um, properties that were adjacent to a, um, a new green infrastructure where people could walk and spend time in, property values went up. We were not expecting that kind of a benefit. So um, there were so many benefits and unex unexpectedly we found benefits. So um, it's really requiring a lot, of, a lot more in-depth analysis to understand um, what the benefits are. And I think whenever we were writing up the life cycle costing portion, um, that's the least informed area in green infrastructure right now. Um, and I think it's just because the assets aren't really mature enough yet, uh, haven't been around long enough yet to fully um, develop life cycle costing. And even for our gray assets, um, life cycle costing is something that takes time to fully develop life cycle cost analysis. So systems that are getting there, I think we will start to see some information on average maintenance costs, um, again, kind of per system. Now, whether that will transfer well from one system to another is 
maybe yet to be determined, but that's where life cycle really um, becomes beneficial is to start fully understanding the cost. So not just that purchase cost or, um, you know, installation construction costs, but maintenance costs and repair costs and, um, you know, disposal costs at the end of the asset's life. And so I think that the information that we're seeking and that we so desire and that people want answers to right now is just a matter of time because it's it's a matter of collecting that data and developing that data. And I think Heather can probably speak on this we, where we have seen some successes with that life cycle cost being developed in the gray world, but it didn't happen in, in year one or even year 10, you know, but where we've seen now that we're starting to make better decisions about which assets to install um, or which assets to plan maintenance for and which assets to allow to run to failure or you know, even how we maintain them, how frequently we maintain them is changing because of the data that we have. And you know, I said Heather can speak to it. I think each one of those I mentioned, Heather has a story for. So we, we don't have time for all of the stories, but that is happening. And, and is benefiting the gray world significantly now and systems are starting to make better decisions because they have better data and that will come for green as well. But that, you know, giving that answer of, well, we just don't have enough information yet sometimes feels inappropriate and insufficient and that's, but it is information that takes time to develop. You know, how much does it cost to maintain this asset for 10 years? Well, I don't know. It's only been in the ground for five. So, you know, <laughs> we don't know what it's going to cost over its life yet. So that's where life cycle will really become useful. And that's where there's the least information for gray and for green, but we're starting to see it happen in the gray world and I know we'll see it happen in the green world too. <laughs> Go ahead, we're, yeah, we're also seeing that our community is really interested in green infrastructure now. Uh, the temperatures have been getting much higher and so everyone's thinking now oh, how do I um, create some coolness and so um, it is very, very popular and that, that kind of a benefit to the community um, is currently measured with, with uh, savings like uh, reducing heat stress. But we're also finding out that, that, uh, that uh, the visual um, appeal of greenery is also reducing stress for people. So police officers are also really interested in having green infrastructure because crime rates go down. It's so shocking to me that, <laughs> that we find this. I actually saw two police officers who were attending uh, a Green Streets seminar and I asked them, why are you guys here? And they explained to me that crime goes down. That That's great. incredible. I mean, we've heard lots of co-benefits, but, um, and you know, obviously I don't listen, you know, I haven't heard from everybody, but I hadn't heard that one before. Maybe others on the call have, but that's an incredible, co-benefit. I mean, wow. <laughs> That's great. Yes. And their sense was, if you can remove all that low laying um, brushy stuff and put in trees, now they have a line of sight uh, over long distances. So they, so no one's hiding behind stuff uh, in doing nefarious activities. And so now mom can go out there walking with her stroller um, and feel safe. That's crazy. Wow. I mean, that's, thank you for sharing that. Cause that is definitely a new one that we've heard lots of other co-benefits, but I hadn't heard that one. So, um, that's great. Cool. We are past time and I know people have other obligations to attend. Um, I think that Heather and Haley and I can stick around for a little bit. If you have more questions, if you have to go, we completely understand. And we want to make sure that we thank you for your time. Um, and for your participation today and that uh, you should have our email addresses too. So feel free to communicate with us um, after this if you're interested or have questions, we will be sure to share the PowerPoint uh, in the recording of the presentation. So, um, And thank you so much for having, you know, so many of your staff members attend. We really appreciate this 
it's kind of what we're trying to achieve is this wider reach and more people to hear the message. So, you know, thank you so much for being responsive and attending. Uh, we just can't thank you enough. Yes, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. And stay tuned, more to come, but at least, you know, <laughs> this is definitely the beginning more so than the end. So stay tuned, there'll definitely be more and, um, um, you know, we'll keep sharing as, as things get rolled out, we'll keep letting people know what's going on. So we really appreciate your time today. And Murdo, I still see, I, again, I hope, give me a thumbs up. Am I pronouncing your name properly? Yeah, you got it right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, you contributed a lot in the chat and we really appreciate that. So thank you for sharing. I wanted to be involved. Pam wanted to make sure I was there. So, so thank you so much for, for joining in and for sharing. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm definitely part of the new accreditation program in Palo Alto and they threw that at me this year, Chapter 40 in APWA. I had to take care of the reaccreditation for Palo Alto for the asset management system. So that's why I say, I mean, you could you could make it an equal playing field by putting gray and green equally by requiring APWA jurisdictions to have a GSI program. But those that don't get in line, uh, trees is requiring the Great point. The APW reaccreditation program is such an awesome system. I wish more cities jumped on board. Yeah, and a lot of those ones, like there was the um, GFOA um, thing that came out. I'm trying to remember how many years ago it is now. It's I've kind of lost track, but the GASB 34, um, the Government Accounting Standard Boards, and it was like 34 was supposed to create asset management in the gray world, and it just did not work because they had the alternative program. Well, you can do asset management or you can do this other thing. So as soon as they said, or you can do this other thing, <laughs> no. everybody scooted over to the, you can do this other thing. So it didn't do what we wanted it to do, but you know, the APWA may be another route where you can try to get these organizations to, to drive some of it as well, which is you know, a great point. So we really appreciate that. Sure, I'm glad to be involved. Well, I'm going to have to run because I have another asset management training in about 20 minutes. So <laughs> have a good day, y'all. I will talk to y'all later. For coming. And I really appreciate everybody Welcome. being here. Bye, everyone. Bye.